Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Consulting with Authority. This is Scott Cantrell. Excited to be joined by a special guest today, Jeff Altman. Jeff Altman is the founder of The Big Game Hunter. He's an accomplished author, career and leadership coach who works with people and organizations worldwide. He's also the host of JobSearchTV.com on YouTube and Amazon, as well as the No BS Job Search Advice Radio on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and elsewhere. Um, Jeff, I'm really excited to talk with you. I know it's going to be a fun conversation today. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure, and I'm sure it will be fun. Good deal. So I always like to begin these um, um, these interviews with just a very basic question so people can kind of understand who you are, what you do. Um, maybe give us a little bit of background in terms of how you got to where you are, and then just a quick overview of, again, what you're doing now, who you're serving, and and uh, the kind of value that you uh, bring to your clients. My pleasure. So first of all, I was born when dinosaurs roamed the earth, or at least <laughs> the Bronx anyway. And um, I'm the son of immigrant parents um, who were entrepreneurial. My dad was entrepreneurial. And um, I grew up uh, in the Bronx wanting to be a pitcher for the Yankees but discovered I couldn't pitch and then had to figure out what to do next. <laughs> and uh, I became a political kid at one point. And in doing that, I had offers from presidential candidates from one election to travel on national staff and realized this was not for me. I did one trip for one candidate where I was under surveillance. I didn't like that feeling. Uh, so I started to look at other things. And I stumbled into recruiting as a career very early on and was trained in all those obnoxious, nefarious things that people hate recruiters for. I behaved that way for quite some time until I got, um, I got the spirit and uh, decided I would do it in an honest way. So if people go to my LinkedIn profile, which is... LinkedIn.com, I am the big game hunter, the forward slashes between those. Uh, what you discover is I've got thousands of uh, endorsements from people, a bunch of recommendations, and many of those came from my time doing recruiting. And we all know everyone hates recruiters with good reason. Uh, eventually, I decided I want to leave recruiting because it is a tough field. Right. And uh, transition into being a therapist in private practice. But I had the good fortune of meeting my wife in graduate school and put that on hold for a while until eventually, you know, uh, we adopted a son from Kazakhstan, you know, the home of Bharat, uh, and uh, traveled there a few months after 9 11 to bring him home. Wow. And uh, yes, it was one of those moments. Yes, it was a wow. And, um, once he was old enough and I was old enough, um, I decided I would do something different because mm -hmm. I put that on hold and I moved into coaching. Uh, so I work with people worldwide around job search, hiring more effectively, managing and leading and workplace related issues. And in the work that I do, I bring a, a, a certain energy to the equation that uh, I think helps people a lot. Yeah. Well, I know in, in our past conversation, uh, enthusiasm is absolutely something that that carries through uh, and is quite contagious when uh, when I hear you speak. So, again, thank you for that quick overview and kind of um, walking us through your story. It's pretty, uh, pretty impactful. Um, the first place I want to turn att our attention to from a consulting standpoint in terms of the work that you do uh, for individuals and organizations uh, is around business development because so many of the people listening to this and consultants, experts, thought leaders, whoever it may be, you know, they have their expertise and they do what they do. And, and for the most part, they do it really well, but they'd love to be able to impact and influence more people, uh, more of the businesses that they want to serve, but getting in front of those opportunities, creating those opportunities, attracting those opportunities is often a challenge, something that they're always looking to do more of. So in terms of your career, um, maybe just identifying some of the key strategies on how you built your, your relationships, how you think about the concept of business development and marketing and putting yourself out there and making sure you're staying visible in front of your prospects. Obviously, you know, a, 
I, I think I can speak for you here. Obviously, you're a huge fan of media in terms of putting out content on a consistent basis. So maybe you can speak to that as well. But kind of give us your philosophy of business development and maybe um, a few tactics that have really helped um, boost your career and your business over time. So back when I started in recruiting, the way you did business development is you got on the phone and you called a bunch of people. And, and again, as a recruiter, that involves institutional customers to get jobs to work on, as well as individuals to fill those jobs. And you get on the phone and say something along the lines of, hi, my name is Jeff Altman. I'm a recruiter. I'm working for fill in the blank. Um, our firm is one that has been very helpful in helping organizations like yours fill positions, just like I saw you advertised in the New York Times. Right. You know, a basic, slimy approach. <laughs> 1970s uh, marketing. And, and, we used, and it worked for a long time. It was sure. very, very effective because it was a numbers game. Right. It was also a style game. And I was very good at being robotic, but still looking as though I had style. And to me, that's one of the differentiators for me and what I do is I do things with style in a way where I connect with people well. And eventually, you do this long enough and you grow to hate yourself. (laughs) Because, you know, you're saying the same things over and over again. Yeah. And your mind starts to turn to mush. Now, I was in a field where, and I'm still in a field, where people don't know how to recognize someone who's capable. Okay, right. And that, I think, is, is true for most people in, in most fields. Sometimes people are able to attach themselves with their corporate name. So, for example, if you say Facebook, there's a certain image associated sure. with working for Facebook or Google, and we could come put in a list of, of organizations. But most people don't have that. And thus it becomes... What do you do for yourself to differentiate yourself? I started writing, and I I did that with what we used to call an easing. Uh, Now, you know, we do it differently. But in those days, uh, you use constant contact uh, because MailChimp wasn't there yet. Right. And you generate uh, a newsletter. In my case, I started every other week. And my first one came out in late August 2001. Okay. In other words, two weeks before 9-11. Yeah, yeah. And I was starting to chronicle the economy at that point, which I recognized was coming out of the recession. Mm -hmm. And when 9-11 happened, I was in New York. Wow. And I saw the second tower come down. Mm -hmm. And I had to be a refugee leaving New York on foot. And I chronicled that for people. and. Uh, just start to write about my experiences and start to write about my expertise. Sure. And in the middle of you know the easy, and I would always have a couple of jobs I was recruiting for. And I built a mailing list up for a lot of years uh, and, and had a good subscriber base. Eventually, that became less important to me. I noticed that open rates became very low, and it just wasn't interesting anymore to get people to read. Because as we all know, no one reads anymore. Very little, unfortunately. Yeah. But once you face the reality of that, the question becomes, how do you connect with your audience? And notice I use the word audience. It could be your clients. It could be anything along those lines that allows you to create an impression because they don't know how to differentiate between one person and another. Right. So... Number one, as a recruiter, I started to do the podcast in, uh, I'm sorry, I actually did YouTube first. I did my first YouTube video back in the days when YouTube limited you to 10-minute videos. I remember that. And my my first video came in at 9 minutes and 58 seconds. (laughs) Uh, And I believe it's called The Easiest Way to Negotiate a Higher Salary for Yourself. And I am a stiff on that. Uh, I'm not, I don't have my glasses on. I'm in a different house at that point. And I'm, it's, hi, my name is Jeff Altman, the big game hunter. And I'm just going to monotonously present my <laughs> ideas. And it was boring. Gotcha. Uh, but it was good. 
Yeah. And it's helped a lot of people. And, you know, I came back a couple of years later and I saw I had 30,000 views of it. And I went, and I didn't monetize this. <laughs> so um, YouTube became one vehicle for me. Yeah. And then in November of 2010, after months of procrastinating, uh, I decided I would do a podcast. I went for the easiest thing I could possibly do, uh, which in those days was blog talk radio, which meant you called in on the phone and they had a free version of this that had a countdown to it. Uh, and you could schedule in advance, but I think you could schedule. In I'm not sure where you could schedule, but uh, I did a Monday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern uh, show about some aspect of job search and yep. ju just started talking for 15 minutes. And out of that came now, uh, as of yesterday, I just uploaded episode 2,186. Wow. Um, so what happened, and then with social, it becomes a lot easier because you take the content and you put it out into the world, mm -hmm. which many people I know are afraid of. Now, one advantage I also have, folks, is I'm LinkedIn member 7653, which means of the 740 million people on LinkedIn, I was the 7,643rd member of the platform. And with a brand like The Big Game Hunter, which I have trademarked for anything employment-related, a lot of people came to me because it's a powerful brand. Yeah. So what I've done is brand myself in a variety of ways so that people get to know, like, trust, and respect me. Because as a recruiter, where everyone hates you, <laughs> you got to do something so that they go, huh, maybe he's different. Yeah. And as a coach, where is, you know, for the women, as long as you have a floral print dress, uh, and for the guys, as long as well, I'm not sure what it is for the guys, but a lot of the coaches I see are really quite mediocre. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as long as you show up, you can announce yourself as a coach. Yeah, and right. I, I decide to differentiate myself and stand out from folks by giving away a lot of information. And I'm a content creation machine. You know, my blog has over 11,000 posts that people can watch, listen to, or read. Wow. That's amazing. So to that end, then, um, what I'm hearing, you, 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 there's a lot there. And I've just been jotting down notes. <laughs> like every, I've been watching you. <laughs> every couple of seconds, yeah. Um, what I'm, uh, two, two big things that I'm taking away, and I want to go deeper on just a couple of them, or one of them. Um, this concept of content creation and how prolific you've been, um, obviously speaks volumes. And so I want to come back to that. I have a couple of questions about that. The second thing you talked about actually branding yourself, right? Creating this personal brand, this professional and personal brand. Uh, so people know who Jeff Altman is, and then they also know what you do. Um, briefly speak to the, the importance of not just having the brand, but making sure that your content and what you say, but not just what you say, not just the content, but the context of how you say what you say. Can you speak to the importance of congruency between the message and the image? Because one of the things that I see consistently, and listen, I don't have it all figured out myself, I'm always a work in progress. But one of the things I do see consistently in the expert space, coach, speaker, author, consultant, whoever it may be, Oftentimes, someone does have their branding down and they're very congruent, but other times it becomes very, very clear that they're going for a particular style of brand, but their messaging is not congruent with that style of branding. So can you speak to that nature of that? How do, how do, you, how do you think about keeping those things congruent? And it's complicated for me because when I did recruiting, it was very easy. Yeah. You know, what I did one day is I recognized that if you say that you're a recruiter, you're, you're tarnished with the same brush that everyone else is. Right. So I was looking for something that would allow me to separate myself from others. 
And I was walking down the street in New York, and suddenly it popped into my mind, the big game hunter, mm-hmm. which was congruent with the idea of headhunter. Right. Yes. It was a nice little sync with that. And it worked for me as long as I worked in search. But then I started to think in terms of, okay, I want to go into coaching. Mm-hmm. And I want to do more than just simply job search coaching, career coaching. How does it work there? Because I've spent a lot of years developing that brand in one context. And I want to acknowledge it's been hard for a lot of my audience to give that up. Gotcha. Initially, I didn't plan on staying in the job search space, but they demanded it of me. Mm-hmm. And thus, I acceded to what their, what their wishes were because my, my knowledge is world-class in that space, mm-hmm. but I broadened it a lot. Yeah. And I started to do more content, or I should say additional content in different ways that address some of, some of the different things that I was interested in. And as I said to someone a week ago, my definition of a career and leadership coach is going to be different than other people's because right. I don't just simply help people with job search or career transition. I think of the totality of a career, which as a manager, as a leader involves hiring, managing and leading more effectively, resolving workplace-related issues that you have so that you can play big in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And that's become the way I've shifted the brand a little bit. And a lot of people only see me in the context of search. Yeah. Because when you do something for as long as I did, which... 40 years. It's a long time. And yeah. You know, when you look at supermarket products where branding has really be, become paramount, yeah. you know, if I say, please don't squeeze the German, you know, suddenly people have an association with that product or any other term. You know, there's lots of things that businesses have done to brand products. Yep. And as individuals, we've got to do things to stand out instead of being a part of. Because if you're, if you're one of many, they don't know how to tell the difference. Yeah. All right. You've so, got to so, be in other words, kind. <clears throat> so, in other words, you can't be one of many. You have to be unique. One of a kind. One of a kind. Yes. Yes. As another mentor of mine, he calls it competing in a vacuum. Right. <laughs> and, and you get to you get to architect that vacuum. Right. You get to right. architect what that that positioning looks like. I think that's really valuable. Um, let's go back to content creation because I know I'm a huge proponent of content and and marketing and selling through education. I always say that the shortest distance between a prospect and a client is education. Because if a prospect is educated on who I am, what I can do, and how I can help them, they're much more likely to become a client than if they don't know those things. So it's not about selling. It's not about features or even benefits necessarily. It really is about, let me tell you how you can get the result you want and show you what that process is and educate you on that. Then if you want me to help you do that, let, let's have a conversation. We can figure that out. So uh, in terms of your content, you're incredibly prolific. You're talking about these 11,000 posts, over 2,000 episodes. Obviously, you've had some time to build up this content uh, over the years. But for someone who is in the midst of their content creation or they're trying to create this, this archive of content, what would you say, what types of content would you say for them to focus on if you have recommendations? And then I think another key thing where a lot of people, uh, present company included, uh, become sometimes intimidated by this content creation issue is just in the amount of content we feel like we have to create. So can you speak to this idea of leveraging content in multiple places, repurposing content in different ways? Because I know that for a lot of folks, that is a you know, um, they feel like they have to create something brand new for every different, every different media channel, but that's not always the case. So maybe you can speak to types of content that you found to be most effective for someone who's just starting or getting started in terms of content development, and then um, how to make, how to create that content creation machine so that it's truly efficient. So I start off with the premise of, I don't know how to answer that question because I don't know who I'm talking to today. Fair enough. Yeah. So different audiences like audio, different audiences like videos, different audiences like the written word. So for example, with COVID now, well, let's work with the assumption we're in the tail end of COVID for for now. 
And people will be back in the gym. Right. And thus, they can listen to podcasts more. They've been trained to watch video. We don't read as much as we used to. Right. So I, I've written eight books and guides to job hunting, another one about hiring. I'm going to have another book probably in the next few months on a, on a new topic. Um, but the idea is you start. And think of a book as a business card for you mm-hmm. that you can hand out to people. Don't think of it as a sales tool because most of right. you will never sell a book. And if you do, it's the friends and family, which doesn't count. Right. But the idea is, you know, if you have a book, you can send it to someone and say, this, I just wrote my first book. I think you'd find it interesting. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Right. If you've right. had a chance to look at it. You can appear on people's podcasts. Notice what I'm doing now, folks. I'm appearing on a podcast. <laughs> <clears throat> right. And through that experience, people get to know, like, trust, and respect you. I always add that extra word in respect mm-hmm. because no like, trust almost sounds like a puppy. <laughs> and I want them to respect my ideas too. Yeah. And thus, I think that part is important as well. I so as you're creating content in whatever medium you believe your audience will receive it best, that's what you do. And you start somewhere. Mm-hmm. So I remember one year I, I woke up, uh, we were on vacation on East of Mujeres in the Caribbean. And I was reading a book and I said, you know, I think what I ought to do is one video a day. Just one, three to five minutes. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to make this complicated. I'm a believer in one one take video. Mm-hmm. I know the subject. I create a title and I work from there. I record. I upload it to YouTube. I'm done. Yep. I'm not going to go for major edits. I consider those screw ups. <laughs> <laughs> so those don't. I, I interrupt myself when I'm doing major screw ups, and I just re-record. Sure. With with podcasts. Once I create enough video, I'm now repurposing the video in podcast form. Understood. In the early days, I created new content from it. Mm-hmm. But I'm about two years behind on my video in converting it to podcast form. Wow. So there's a gap in there that works very well. And for years, I did a seven-day-a-week podcast. Mm-hmm. Now it's five. I decided to give myself a break and do something a little bit different. Sure. but. Everything I do is designed to create an impression within with my audience that they can believe me. Now, how you how you deliver the content? There are lots of different ways, and different platforms like different things. But the one thing I'll say is, you can share a link, and there are tools that allow you to schedule. Right, and if you have a website. And then once you have it, let's say, uploaded to YouTube, there's a tool that will deliver it back to you for your website into the blog that you can then share uh, to whoever the recipients of the posts, which can be distributed to any number of social media channel. So uh, my stuff automatically generates to LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and a couple of other places as well. Every time the post goes out, I have it transcribed as well because Google likes text. Mm -hmm. So you gotta give them text. And I know this sounds like a lot of work and it is. It's why no one does this like I do because they're not prepared to put in the effort. You don't have to do it my way. You can do it more simply. Mm-hmm. And just start with one. Do one post a week. Graduate to two. Graduate from there to three. You can build it up over years. But the idea is start. Yep. You're yeah. an expert at what you do, just like I am at what I do. And thus, folks, you can be. You have to demonstrate that you're world class. Good enough isn't. Excellence is what the audience wants to see from you. 
and they're going to get it. They're going to get it from you for free. Yeah. And what's amazing is once they get it to you from for free, they want to connect with you. Like one of my favorite stories is when I first transitioned into coaching. Someone approached me uh, about coaching them, and we get on the first call. And they go, "Wow." I've seen that painting before and that backdrop. It's you. And he was enamored with the fact that he was actually talking to yeah. me. Because for him, I was a celebrity. Right, right. Absolutely. And, and that's that, what you're trying to create for the audience. That had been strategically and intentionally, you had strategically and intentionally done that. Um, but but doing it not in an ego-driven way, doing it in a, I, I know that if I share myself, if I share that excellence, if I share that education, if I share this content, this value, that people, the right people will be attracted to it and I'll be able to engage them. Um, you know, there, there was someone I was coaching around leadership who was going in front of a panel that was going to evaluate him for a role within their nonprofit. Mm-hmm. And he'd been rejected by them once and was going back for a second cut at the approval. Yeah. And he was going to have 15 minutes to get their attention to get approved. So think of this, a 15-minute interview for which he's flown halfway across the country. Yeah. And he walks into the room and he remembered what I told him going in. Because the first time he went up, he held back and he was very formal. And his the feedback he received was, you'd be great in front of the board, but not with us. Wow. Yeah. And I told him as he went up for the second time, I said, risk everything. Yeah. Wow. And folks, when you're creating content, you've got to risk everything. You've got to put yourself out there, even if you think you're going to be rejected or criticized, because the right person is going to respond to you. You can't be a generalist anymore. Yeah. It just doesn't work. Audience, how many channels do we have on, on TV? And then you add Netflix and Prime and Hulu and Apple TV and all the other venues for for content. You know, it's so partitioned. It's so chopped up. And that's what we go for. And that's what people go for as well. And that's the opportunity too, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's not just, it's not just that you're restricted in terms of you can't be a generalist anymore. The opportunity is in niching down on a particular subject and or with a particular market segment or whatever it may be. And like you said, being being authentic, but also being willing to put everything out there, to risk everything, as you say, to be vulnerable, to keep it real, to not be blasé or vanilla or bland, but to, to own who you are. Um, it, if you're an expert in your field, then be the expert in the field and 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 own that space. So and what's funny is, Folks, I know the excuse that you're going to give. You're going to say, I'm not an expert. I'm good, but I'm not an expert or anything. Right. You're expert to someone else. Yeah. Yeah. And just recognize you can't be an expert to everyone, but for someone else, there are a lot, you know, you, your message will get across. Like if you've been on Clubhouse, sure. Um, you know, People on Clubhouse that are up on stage present themselves as experts in a lot of things. Right. And a few of them are, and many of them are not. Right. But they have the authority of being on stage exactly. and being the mod. And thus, they're, they're creating a brand around that, even though they're a best mediocre. Yeah, I mean, it's often true. And and Clubhouse is just a platform, like, I mean, it's a great example, but that that uh, c- scenario you just described just repeats on any platform, right? Uh, Clubhouse yeah. is an easy one to use as an example because it's so clear, right? And if you do some due diligence, and obviously, you know, I would ar- argue uh, to do your due diligence on the people that you follow and the people you mentor with or, or have coach you in different areas and make sure they are who they say they are and they can do what they say they can do. But the bigger the bigger takeaway is it's, it's, it's easier than ever to build a congruent brand. It's easier than ever to publish content, automate the scheduling. Um, and the takeaways that I wrote down here were, you know, in terms of content strategy, number one, just begin. Keep it, uh, number two, keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate it. Um, 
be authentic, be vulnerable, and and and, and go back to the number one again. Just begin. Just get started. You uh, over time, you will build that archive. It's not about trying to fill up the vault in the first two or three months, right? Just get going and add one thing on top of another. Don't, don't feel like you have to give everything all at once. And you'll notice when you go back and look at your old stuff, you'll think it's terrible. Yes. Well, I, Me I too. got a bunch of old stuff that I was like, please, please. I'm not, I don't want to get this anywhere close to the internet. All right. <laughs> let's, let's I say, put it out. I don't care. Yeah. And yeah. Every of course. Once in a while I repurpose it. I say it's from the archives. Yes. So exactly. People know it's old stuff. Well, and sometimes, and sometimes, as you well know, uh, there is gold in some of the old stuff too. It's not all bad, right? Some of it is, some of it is gold that just needs to be polished up and put back out because it's time has come again. Uh, that that is a fantastic conversation, um, really valuable. You mentioned a story. You told a story about when you transitioned into coaching, and so using that as a transition, using that as a segue, can you speak to a little bit about your process? So I'm assuming that a lot of your prospects now are are seeing you on your web TV show or they're hearing your podcast or they're reading your blog post. You know, they've been exposed to your content, your knowledge, your expertise in some way, probably before they talk with you mm -hmm. uh, the first time personally. Um, would you mind sort of uh, sharing with us how you engage with a new prospect? What is that from the time you have that first meaningful conversation, that first engagement all the way to the point where, you know, you're working with them. What does that, what's that client engagement process look like? I know for a lot of the, the consultants and experts that I consult with and work with, this is one of the things that we always focus on. How can we make that process um, consistent? Uh, as, as automated as it needs to be, and I say that last part of that phrase critically, you can automate certain parts of your process, but you certainly don't need to automate other parts. So, but how can you, keep that process consistent, make it efficient and, and obviously effective. Would you mind sharing a little bit about what yours looks like? So the simplest thing I did was a few years ago, I bought calendaring software annually. So it's a software as a service where people have access to my calendar. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you say, of course, I know a lot of people who complain about the scheduling process with different people. Oh no, that, uh, but, no, that's very true. No. I, well, the reason I said, of course, is because I, I adopted it maybe, um, to about two years ago. And, and I was one of those people who was resistant to it. I was one of those people who was like, well, if I put the appointment out there, they can just ignore it. And I was like, I, I, the realization I had is if I put the link out there and they ignore it, doesn't that, doesn't that give me an indication of how bad they really want to talk to me? <laughs> Isn't that a qualifier in and of itself? I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, I'm, no, okay. I'm tracking with you. Go ahead. So it starts off with, how do they reach out to me? Do they send me an email, a text? Do they message me through LinkedIn? How do they get in touch with me? Uh, a woman contacted me this morning um, and I said, you know, I want to talk with you about my review. Do you have any time today? I'm on the West Coast. I give her my calendar link. Uh, she puts herself on my calendar and it automatically generates a Zoom link for her uh, and thus we'll meet on zoom have an initial 30 minute conversation uh, because i don't know if i can help everyone mm -hmm. but i'll do a preliminary conversation so that in this way i can fit i can see whether i can help and they can size me up sure i'll put a proposal in writing to them and then follow up with uh, in, with an email a second email if necessary. And the third one is the, I guess you've chosen someone else email and I'm going to stay in touch with you from time to time, but you're under no pressure or obligation. Uh, if you don't want to receive the messages, my feelings aren't hurt. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so that's the simple process. And when I start coaching with someone, um, you know, my opening question invariably is bring me up to date on what's been going on for you. I just want to get them talking because once they start talking, they'll get to the real conversation. Yep. Yep. Well, and this is part of my therapy training. 
Well, that I, I mean, it makes perfect sense. And once they get talking, you're, you're now listening for areas where you can bring value or not, right? And so you're trying to, that the whole nature of that conversation is to filter and qualify or disqualify that opportunity. And if they are qualified and there seems to be interest then you put together uh, a, a proposal. I guess it depends on obviously the scope of what you'll be doing mm-hmm. for them and what that looks like. Are your is your coaching regimen? And you don't have to get into the details of this, but just in general terms, in terms of the work that you do as a coach, is it? Do you have um, regimented coaching solutions or products packages that you offer that are sort of? you know, we're going to meet this many times over this amount of time. And we're going to talk about these things. It's sort of curriculum a lot, you know, has a curriculum behind it and a timeline behind it, or are, is the coaching that you do more customized and, and uh, dependent upon, you know, what the particular client is looking for, or is it a hybrid of both? I'd say a hybrid. I'll give you an example of how it works. Mm -hmm. Uh, A man contacted me some years ago, he was up for a position. He wanted me to prepare him for an interview. So that would be a particular service I would offer, a 45-minute right. interview prep session, which, by the way, folks, it is terrific. And from there, he decided to continue on with me. Mm-hmm. And we worked on him getting a position that would move him from the U.S. to Germany, where he was like, a fairly senior person in marketing, but didn't have an officer's title. I see. Uh, and he wanted to continue on with me to help him be effective in his role, mm-hmm. which I'm great at because uh, I bring all my trainings in, into play. Uh, and then there was the point where he realized, and I was hammering about him about this for quite some time, that the organization didn't respect youth. They didn't respect energy. Mm. They were kind of sedentary and valued longevity. So if he wanted to stay there for the next 10 years, it'd be great. Yeah. But they weren't going to, even though he created some great campaigns Mm. that were used globally with great effect, but he was still going to be seen as that kid Mm -hmm. for a lot of years. Uh, And thus there came the time where he spoke with me about, I think it's time for me to go. And I helped him step into his new role as CMO of an organization Mm -hmm. and helped him almost double his salary. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and helping him in the current environment too and helped him negotiate the package because they came in a little light on the money. Mm -hmm. And I just helped him negotiate a package that upped the base, increased the reload, because it was a U.S.-based position, you know, when he could join since uh, his wife was expecting, and, you know, they would have the advantage of uh, the German system, which is she could take a lengthy leave right. at full pay, and thus he could work remotely and travel to the U.S. when needed. So there's lots of things that I'll do to work with someone. So it can start with one service mm-hmm. and escalate to something broader. Sure. Or we just dive right in and do something that's package oriented. Mm -hmm. And the fun thing is when I work with someone over a long time, I have the opportunity to really be with them. Right. And not just simply deal with this transaction. Looking for a job, got an interview, got to negotiate salary, want me to look at the resume. It's all transaction. Yes, of course. But when I work with someone long term, I want that being, and I'm going to use a term that we don't, really uh, respect in the U.S. That, mo- that much anymore. I could be an elder for them, that right. wise, trusted individual that they can speak with who doesn't have a vested interest in whether or not they take this job or that job or you know, get this situation or that situation. I'm there to serve them getting what they want professionally or handling a situation. Someone that they can trust because internally when firms assign a mentor, that's an agent for the organization. Yes, right. Exactly. You're not getting that third party outside unobjective or uh, objective, I should say, objective expertise and guidance that you that you should want and do need. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what I try to do is create breadcrumbs for people yeah. that they'll follow to me. And with those breadcrumbs, start working on developing a relationship so that they'll want to come to me. Mm-hmm. 
because that makes a huge difference than the, hey, this is Jeff Altman and I'm a recruiter. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and and because of what you're doing actively in terms of the media and the content you're putting out and the impressive archive and inventory of everything you pre- previously have done, you 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 can and are attracting these ideal prospects who are who are then perfect in terms of who you're looking for to to do direct one-on-one client work for. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, We're coming to the end of our interview, Jeff. So, I mean, this has just been phenomenal. We could have stopped maybe 10 or 15 minutes in and it would have been uh, well worth it. So thank you so much for the time. I wanted to conclude with just a couple of, of, uh, simple questions to ask. One of them is simple to answer. The first one um, may or may not be simple to answer, but it's a really valuable question, I think. In terms of your career, right? you've done a lot of different things. Uh, your focus has obviously been on uh, helping people up their game to get better results in their career. Uh, there's lots of ways that you can affect positive change with someone. But in your experience, in your career, or in helping others, in your observation or personal experience, what are some of the biggest lessons learned that could be beneficial for other people like me, uh, consultants, experts, coaches, uh, author, speakers who want to grow their business, who want to go to that next level. Any uh, any uh, words of wisdom from uh, the elder sage here, so to speak? Start off with developing acute listening skills. Okay. And, and notice what's said and unsaid. Because what's unsaid is often very interesting. There's someone I was coaching today um, who owns a, three small businesses. Mm-hmm. And he does pretty well. One of them, uh, which is, you know, isn't doing as well as he would really like. And he's talking to me about this approach or that approach that he's taking. And I noticed uh, something in his manner uh, as we were coming up on the end of the session, I said, what's been useful for you today? And he told me about some of the things that have been helpful. That was great. And I said, you know, I have the idea that it might make sense for us to end the session with you uh, offering a prayer. Now, I've never done that with anyone before. Wow. But his head kind of cocked. It was like a Scooby-Doo moment. Right, if you remember right. from the Scooby where he would go, Ugh! Right. And he was thrilled. Mm. So you have an intuition. Mm-hmm. Use it. Notice what's said and unsaid and test it. Yep. And let it go. Sometimes it'll work. Most of the time it'll work. Right. And you're going to learn something from it. And don't sweat it. Yeah. If you make a mistake, it happens. Yep. Uh, that's excellent. Um, I will tell you in my, my brief career, uh, comparatively to yours, um, I will tell you the people that I am most attracted to professionally and in working with are, seem to be the people who ask me the most engaging questions. And, and that I believe is simply an indicator that they're listening to what I'm saying. Um, and they're asking those right questions. And then, of course, they're not asking the questions and then ignoring me, right? They're asking the questions to engage with me further, to truly try to understand who I am, where I am, where I want to go, and if or how they can help me get there. And so and the fun thing that you start to notice is the more they talk, the more they like you. <laughs> well, that is that is true, right? Uh, the person, the, the, the old cliche, which I think holds a lot of truth. The person, uh, one, the one asking the questions is in control of the conversation. Um, and oftentimes that is the case um, because they are the listener. And we, in today's world, especially where, where we are talking and where we need to talk and share our content, uh, but where everybody is talking and trying to get their message across it is those people who are truly authentically listening and empathizing with us that I believe um, have our ear, have our attention, uh, have, have our, um, they've, they've captured, they've captured our, our engagement. So I think it's a great note. Last question is a simple one. If someone wants to find out more about Jeff Altman, if they want to engage with you, if they want to watch uh, your web TV show, if they want to uh, listen to the podcast, 
Uh, they've got a lot to go through. They have 11,000 posts, 2,000 plus episodes, a number of books, et cetera. But if they want to find out more about who you are, what you do, or potentially engage with you, how, what's the best way for them to, to get into your world? I've got two websites. So if you want everything I've done, it's at TheBigGameHunter.us. T-H-E, BigGameHunter.us. There's a game guy who's got the dot-com address. Gotcha. Uh, he, he's created and sells games. Uh, without the job search material, NoBSCoachingAdvice.com. And of course, you can go to JobSearchTV.com. You can watch me on Amazon. That's the name of the channel there. Uh, I'm on Roku, but there's a like a, a month and a half delay on my content going up there. So it's less valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the podcast is an Apple podcast, Spotify, Google Play, wherever there's a podcast available, you can, you can listen to me. That's fantastic. That's awesome. So the big game hunter, the big game hunter dot us and no BS coaching advice dot com uh, is where you can find Jeff. Uh, Jeff, Thank you so much for contributing your time, being very generous with your time and your expertise today. Been very helpful to me. I can only assume that it's also been very, very helpful to our listeners and viewers. So thank you again. You're welcome. I want to close with one thing. And that's, I've had a campaign to tell people not to say, take it easy. Because okay. it's one of those things, take it easy, like be lazy. I see. Instead, okay. Instead, why don't we just tell people to, to, to not put in great effort? After all, we're going to at some I, point. I, so I that's it. why I end my shows, my videos, by saying, be great. I love it. I want to encourage you best, not mediocrity. I love it. I love it. Well, then I will echo that sentiment um, for Consulting with Authority and Jeff Altman. This is Scott Cantrell wishing you the best of success. And in Jeff's words, be great, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. Thank you for listening. I hope you got a ton of value out of this episode. And before we go, I want to thank the sponsor of our show, Smart Solutions Media. Smart Solutions Media empowers business owners, consultants, and other independent professionals to easily attract better prospects and transform them into long-term clients. If you're a B2B consultant or service professional and would like to start filling your pipeline with better quality prospects, Visit us on the web at smartsolutionsmedia.com to learn more about what we can do to help you. Be sure to complete this short two-minute accelerated growth scorecard you can find on the website, and you'll receive a complimentary strategy session where we'll give you specific insights and recommendations to help you attract high-value clients. Until next time, make sure you are consulting with authority.